Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Jackson. Here we are. 11.30 mainland time. 11.30 mainland time. That is <laughs> it. Which fortunately is the same for you and me. That's exactly right. Where are you in Toronto or Chicago? Mm-hmm. 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 In Toronto, yeah. Toronto, yeah. I got back from Chicago Thursday night, and then we're off to Phoenix on Thursday for the Genius Network. Oh, it's going to be a, a banner week. I get to see you in two to three different places in three different weeks. I saw you in Toronto yeah. and then Chicago and then yeah. here in Cloudlandia and then on the mainland of Phoenix. There you go. There you go. And anyway, um, I have to tell you, you know, the um, simplifier multiplier distinction is another one of those uh, things that just pops up and then it kind of takes off. So uh, for our listeners, I just did a little exercise in um, the um, top, top, the third top level of the strategic coach, where I just asked people to identify three big wins as an entrepreneur, where they simplified something and three big wins where they multiplied something and then they talked about it. And then I asked them the question, well, if you could just focus on one of these simplifying or multiplying, um, which would be um, attractive to you, which, which one would be more attractive to you? And then it went, it really went big uh, after asking that question. So what was your take? Cause I didn't get a chance to really chat with you on that. Well, I'm definitely a simplifier. And oh, they're both simplifiers for both simplifiers. Yes. It's almost in, it's almost incestuous. Mm-hmm. And that is uh, you know, I was saying in our discussion groups, uh, when I was having the conversations with people that the um yeah, I that fits so well with my love of the scale ready algorithm of being Mm -hmm. able to figure out the crack, the code to create a result in the simplest way and then have it, you know, packaged and ready for a multiplier, a scaler to now scale the, um, to scale the algorithm. And it's funny how, you know, uh, Joe polish and I always, sit beside each other in in the free zone frontier and uh you know we were talking about you know joe really is more of a multiplier that's really joe's a total joe's a total multiplier Mm -hmm. yeah i mean um uh above and beyond yeah almost any that i've ever met in my life Mm mm-hmm and it's magic, you know. It's funny. Um, there's a third element of this, I think, and maybe let's talk about this because I was sharing with Joe Polish that the uh, Joe Stump and I were talking about the collaboration. You know, we had many year collaboration that was a, a very successful collaboration, but we had a there was a third element of Terry Hunnefeld, who was tying everything together with the process. If we take like m- me as a, uh, a simplifier and Joe as a multiplier, Terry Hunnefeld was an integrator might be the right word of this mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. a, uh, mm-hmm. you know, so if you look at mm-hmm. that and I didn't, I didn't ask, uh, or bring it up with Gino Wickman, but that might be the, that might be the thing. Well, have you talked to him about it? What his take? No, on- no, but it's funny. You should ask because, uh, Kathy Davis, um, was pondering at the back of the room because, um, we had time during the entire week because I brought this up in every single workshop last yeah. week. And then I brought it up in, three workshops are being coached by the other entrepreneurs and it got exactly the same result just in its concept form because with the other coaches, I just brought it up as an idea, a talk through mm-hmm. and everybody in the room just immediately, you could see the brains crack, you know, I mean, yes. you could just tell it. 
And then they had a lot of Q&A, which um, had to be cut short because the coaches have a full, you know, they have a full workshop to right. coach. Um, but I was talking to Kathy about it. She says, you know, um, um, she says, I'm kind of in the middle. So I think that's Terry, um, you know, Terry. Yeah. Um, yeah. She's an integrator because she has right. a feel. Yeah. But she's a responder to either a simplifier or a responder to a multiplier. Yes. I mean, yes. And and I think it's right. I th- I think you're ac- absolutely right. And that's a third thing that definitely has to be positioned there. And I think it shows up in the Colby because the uh-huh. middle uh, middle numbers, which is called facilitator or mediator, yep. is in fa- fact finder, follow through, quick start, and implementer. You're not. You're always between four and six. You know, you're not one to what you know you're not one right. to three mm-hmm. and you're not seven to ten you're four to six yeah and you're not you're not an initiator you're a responder right yeah a simplifier is an initiator a multiplier is an initiator yeah I mean, that's the thing some, i'm definitely i'm an initiator of ideas as simplification, a ten, simplification as a simplifying simplification. 10 quick start right but it's interesting but, I'm a one. Well, it's really course, funny because somebody, yeah, somebody said to me in one of the other coaches, he said, well, uh, how can you be a simplifier? You're a 10 quick start. And I said, uh-huh. I'm a 10, I'm a 10 quick start simplifier. Right. And I said, I want, I want to tell you, I've, I know a nine fact finder multiplier. Uh huh. Yeah. So I don't think that Colby really determines one way or another. Right. I think it's something completely different. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I told him the Irish joke that a man is walking down a dark alley in Belfast one night and he feels a gun in his back and the voice comes over his shoulder. He says, now tell me, are you a Protestant or are you a Catholic? And he says, I'm a Jew. And the oh. voice says, ah. And the voice says, ah, are you a Protestant Jew or a Catholic Jew? <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. So I know 10 quick start multipliers, and you and I are 10 quick start mul- simplifiers. Yes. Yeah, this is really, um, it's, a, it's an interesting um, thing to play around with. Because I see that, you know, we've come to that conclusion um, just in observing what we were looking at, yeah. why that why that worked so well was the was having that third, that third tying it together. Mm-hmm. Who mm-hmm. does that? Who is that role? Like if you're saying that you are a um a simplifier in within your organization that yeah and babs is the chief multiplier multiplier yeah and then what would be that glue in between well we have a number yeah Uh, well uh kathy davis is a big one i mean she would be at the top she would be at the top of the list but we have about Three or four others who have that on a Colby on a Colby scale, they have that, and it's the only Colby that, without a job description in mind, we will hire the person just on the basis of their Colby, regardless of, of whether we actually have it. Of, yeah, of all middle, they're like, they'll hire. Yeah, yeah, they're like enzymes, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you just know that this person is going to be useful. Because yeah. they're not, you're not expecting them to initiate anything. You're yeah. expecting them to take people who are already initiating. And now we have the clarity of uh, initiating simp- simplifiers or initiating multipliers and make yeah. sure the simplifiers and the multipliers are talking to each other. Yeah. That's funny because I think my steward is a five, four, six, four or yeah. something, you know, right yeah. up in the middle like yeah. that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know, if you they didn't have an initiator uh, initiator around, you might as well stand stand them up and put them in the closet, you know, because uh-huh. they don't they don't they don't start anything, you know, they don't start. They have to have something to respond to before they go into action. Yes, I'm just seeing something now that really I look at this now. 
what I need in my own organization are more multipliers. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's, the, you know, that's where I'm looking now. I mean, I have, uh, you know, Carrie Oberbrunner, who's just multiplied me out to 39,000 Audible platforms with two of the books so far with the 156 book and the hero book. Yeah, and uh, my test was it was uh, Waterstones in London, and uh, mm-hmm. so we did a Facebook Live on a Sunday for the 156 book, and so that was Sunday afternoon. And on Tuesday, Waterstone was featuring this as a new book, and with the Hero book, uh, we did it on a Thursday evening, and Waterstone on Sunday morning was featuring it as a new book. So that. Kind on of the, a little on program. the website, yeah. On their yeah, on their website, mm-hmm. on their Audible Audible website. You mm-hmm. know? So it's really it's really really interesting. But he derives enormous pleasure of finding new places to put things. You know, mm-hmm. if he comes up with something. You know, and um, so you know, and I have that with uh, the collaboration of Ben Hardy and Tucker Max and uh, Reed Tracy now. Mm-hmm. With, uh, you know, um, and, um, you know, but th- their joy is in multiplying things and their joy mm-hmm. is in actually multiplying things. So Ben does it on his blog. I mean, he's always finding other people's ideas and, you know, adding value to the ideas and then getting it out to, he's got a really big, uh, he's got a really big list. Readership mm-hmm. list. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, so uh, yeah, and the world needs both. I mean, uh, one is worthless without the other. Oh, agreed. And I think that, and then, is, and the two don't work together, and yet, unless you have the third. I saw, I was just saying, is that's what Joe Polish and I were talking about is that yeah. there's a great, and you could see great synergy and potential synergy between us, but yeah. there's the, the, lack of a integrator yeah to tie that all together that's exactly yeah uh, yeah and i'm not sure it's strictly uh strictly uh, colby defined i mean it's no. just that we've always found that the colby uh with that particular profile uh, and for those who yes. don't know what i'm talking about the colby is a online test that you can do to see what you most naturally um, would like to do to get a result in the world. Mm -hmm. And you can go to KOLBE.com and in 30 minutes and $50, you can have your profile. um, It's the most insightful because it certainly is the thing to realize that you're uh, where to support yourself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. we've been doing it for 25 years with Coach, mm-hmm. and um, they calculated that half of their uh, sales in the last uh, 25 years came from strategic coach related um, signups. Wow, and people doing it for their whole team or their uh, yeah, yeah, and their uh-huh. friends and their customers and everything yes. else. And, yeah, yeah, and it's a great thing because uh, we didn't ask for any deal. You know, we just mm-hmm. think it's a great uh, it's a great help. You know, mm-hmm. so um, uh, and we don't have to work on it. So <laughs> you know? Right. I mean this this whole thing about. Uh, you know, uh, what we're talking about is if you can choose a capability over a cash, uh, go for the capability because it can grow and grow and grow without anyone knowing about it, including the internal revenue service. Right. Exactly. That's funny. Um, you know, I was thinking about the, there was a show, um, a few years ago when Oprah was wrapping up her show. And she was doing her 25th season. Um, They did a behind the scenes show, uh, like a series, a reality show, documenting the whole 25th season. And Mm -hmm. I found that very instructive, um, the way that she organizes the stuff. Uh, Going from memory, I think they do 108 shows that uh, make up a season. And they have, she has a team of six or eight production teams made up of a 
senior producer and two associate producers and some, you know, junior producers or whatever um, underneath it. But she has an executive producer, senior executive producer, Sherry Salata, who seems to be the one who ties everything together. Like, uh, and they'll all gather and they'll map out the whole season. It looked like a big brainstorm session kind of thing, mapping out the arc of everything they want to do. And then each of these, you know, eight producers gets a dozen shows or some, you know, however it uh, works. And they are responsible within their team of producing the entire show. And so they go on a, when they're filming, they do, they'll film six shows a week or something. So they get an an extra one in the thing, two shows a day for three week, three uh, days. And Mm -hmm. each production team will kind of come in and have their meeting with Oprah and Sherry about that particular show. And then they'll go back with their team and divide it all up through um, all the way down to segment, segment producers where somebody's in charge of this segment of the show. And uh, it was a pretty masterful lesson Mm -hmm. in, in teamwork like that, like to, to see how many people it takes to, to make a show like that work. Oh yeah. 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 Well, you know, I was, uh, uh, really struck. Uh, I came across an article that says that there's no famous one, one man band, you know, that if you look in history, you'll Mm -hmm. have certain individuals who are put up as the introducer of something. Okay, but that's somebody from two or three hundred years later who's looking back and doesn't know any of the facts. And I'll give you an example. I was in London and uh, what sticks out when you walk around London, the old, you know, the um, classical part of London uh, is just the overwhelming evidence of Bernini, who is a sculptor. Uh And uh, the Vatican, the whole portico of the Vatican, in other words, the, you know, there's this vast round sort of set of uh, pillars yeah you know it's uh they're round pillars in a round uh shape and then there's yes mountain, uh, virtually all the fountains of rome yeah. and like uh, you know uh, everything else they're bernini yeah bernini Bath, had ten, england bernini mm-hmm. had ten thousand bernini had ten thousand workers that worked for him yeah, you know, right. and he had he had finger guys, he had ear guys, he had nose guys. And, yes. Yeah, you know, and and what he was was a real great conceptualizer. So he could draw out in rough form, you know, what a statue would look like, what a fountain would look like, and everything else. And then he said his skilled um, executors. Um, yeah. Uh, to the ta- to the task. And um, I think it's one of the great, uh, what I would say, uh, fallacies of history is remembering breakthroughs just in terms of a single individual. Mm -hmm. That sounds a lot like what um, you introduced me to the concept of of art and craft. And Mm -hmm. it with um, I saw a documentary about Dale uh, Chihuly the glass yeah. artist that you yeah. know you brought to my attention that he doesn't even blow the glass anymore. He can't. Yeah. Uh, Cause he's lost an eye. He's lost yeah. An eye, you know? yeah. Yeah. And you think of all of the great artists like this, like um, Andy Warhol and yeah. uh, we'll have the factory and um, Jeff Koons is a fabricator, you know, of yeah, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's There's all something teamwork. To that. And, um, yeah. yeah, and Shakespeare, you know, he had dozens of, um, you know, a skilled pers- people around him, the actors, the stage designers. He had, you know, I mean, he had a full-blown entrepreneurial um, uh-huh. enterprise, an enterprise going, you know. He was the first uh-huh. actor who owned 
who owned a theater, who had his own acting group and everything like that. But you don't, um, it, I mean, all you have to do is wait and, uh, I just saw, what did I see? Uh, oh, I went to see the Downton Abbey. Um, um, Downton How Abbey. was that? The movie? It was fabulous. It was fabulous. And you didn't have to have seen the, um, you would not have had to see the television the show. to actually okay. enjoy it. To actually enjoy it. Yeah, it was really great. Yeah, had I mean, first seen, class. Had you seen the show? Oh, yeah. I, I watched I watched all the Oh, you did? Okay. Well, series. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, there was a sort of uh, joy to that in the sense that old characters were coming back again. Yeah. So, you know, you almost wanted to clap when one of them came back, you know, appeared I on the you. screen. Oh, okay. But then at the end, Babs and I just watched the credits. And I, I have to tell you, credits went on for 10 minutes. Yeah. You know, and you, yeah. you just begin to realize the sheer network. Life is a team people. sport, for sure. Oh, oh yeah. Any yeah, mul- and, multiplication is a team sport, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and the thing is, people are saying, well, you know, things are going to be different in the future. Everything has to be done in vast teams. And I said, I want to let you in on something. Anything that got created in the past also happened because vast and vast teamwork. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I said, I said this this whole notion. You know, and I think, uh, you know, anytime you try to violate this and uh, um, you uh, run into problems, you know, and yes. it's funny, uh, funny because the great example of that in the 19th century was Nikola Tesla, who didn't play well with others. Yes. And uh, it, it's funny that, um, you know, it, it's kind of amusing to me that uh, Elon Musk, I think, also doesn't play well with others. And he names his first car Tesla. And, uh, you know, he, his car his car is called a Tesla. But my feeling mm-hmm. is that he's missed window after window of opportunity of going really big because he, he uh, insists on, you know, not including as many different skills as possible to take his ideas worldwide. I think the ideas are great. I think, I think his technology is great, but uh, I have to tell you the combined intelligence of the entire car industry is a thousand times smarter than one man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you think so? I think so too. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. 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 There's a lot of different, you know, there's a lot of different smarts. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. 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 And anyway, so, um, anyway, so, uh, I, I think the, the part, part of the problem with this is the emphasis on, um, this isolated movement through the educational system that probably starts a junior kindergarten now and goes through to graduate school where it's you, you know, it's just you and you're being tested and you have to do your assignments by yourself and you have to, you know, you can't cheat. You can't bring other people in. And I think it's. Uh, I have a friend all, uh, that is funny. Um, I have a friend that that they, what they call unschool their kids, and yeah. one of his uh, kids, you know, is a twelve year old, and and he works on, you know, coding projects and things that he's uh, <laughs> interested in. Of course he, he does. To do, of course he does. He, and he has to do, uh, you know, the regular curriculum like through um homework uh you know like math and all all the stuff that uh they have to do for the standardized tests but he's they set it up and show him he has to organize it but he outsources that to to uh offshore to for somebody to do his uh math assignments his yes assignments to, and... to do the not <laughs> Not the actual he's got learning. Homework. Yeah, not the actual he's learning homework. of it. But he's he's yeah. outsourcing he's outsourcing the busy work of his homework. Yeah. So he's yeah. working on the coding and the things that he's most interested well, he's in. Well, outs- he's outsourcing the credential work and working so that he's freed up to work on the capability work. Yeah. Oh, that's a good distinction. I hadn't heard yeah, that yeah, distinction. Because, Credentials no, just, versus capabilities yeah yeah i mean the school system is really heavy on credentials 
Yes. You know, it's heavy on but it, the, all the credentials in the world doesn't guarantee any kind of capability except the yes. capability to get credentialed. You know, I mean, it's a, wow. It's a, <laughs> That's a good one, actually. And all the capability in the world doesn't require a credential. That's exactly right. Yeah. Capabilities for the win. Yeah, I mean, I mean, so let's just go back to your 12-year-old. My feeling is that if a 12-year-old understands how he can develop his capabilities, then he should have the right to outsource all of this credential work. That is really, I mean. Two tracks. Yes. If you're a credential person with no yes. notion of your capabilities, well, then yeah. you do all the credential work. And maybe if lightning strikes somewhere down the road, you might end up with a capability. Yes. Wow. That's, you know, I wonder, I know that the, your um, university that you went to. St. John's. St. John's. Um, yeah. And what you studied the the great books, great books, great and books, that yeah. was really the so it wasn't really curriculum um, based or uh, credential. Well, uh, it, based. well, everybody had no. to do the same thing. You yeah. Know? So yeah. all the reading was exactly the same reading for each of the four years. So you mm -hmm. went, and it's done chronologically. So you start with the Greeks, and then you. You know, you move up through the Romans and then medieval and then Renaissance and then Enlightenment. And uh, you get up to about, you know, probably 1900 with Einstein is probably uh -huh. Einstein, Freud, Freud. And, yes. uh, and um, heavy, heavy reading. I mean, you have to be yeah. a reader and right. you have to. Uh, and, so um, heaven for a guy like you. Yeah, I'm a you know I'm a huge reader. Yeah, and uh, and um, and then um, the ability to uh, you have to have um, good verbal skills. You have to you know you have to be able to partake in discussions, and you have yeah. to be able to start with a question that the um, um, the teacher they 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 don't call professors. They're called yeah. uh, tutors. They're called tutors because the job of the tutor is to actually get people to think about what they've been reading and then do it in discussion groups and yes. everything. And yes. not much writing at all. You got one major paper, I think, per semester, two semesters. So mm -hmm. maybe eight papers in um, four years. Um, it's got some great, great strengths and some great, great weaknesses. You know, looking back... Um, it sort of attracts introverted, um, uh, introverted eccentrics. Mm -hmm. They're eccentric. Uh, the people who are attracted to that college are eccentrics, yeah. and they tend to be introverts. And as far as I can tell, they don't do much afterwards. You know, and probably mm -hmm. I'm I'm approaching you know the top two two percent have ever gone to college. You know, and actually taking what I learned and gone out and done something with it. They tend to show up as uh, in the professions like lawyers and, mm -hmm. you know, doc lawyers, mainly lawyers and doctors and, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. civil servants of some kind, or, mm -hmm. you know, um, they tend not to be entrepreneurs at all. And um, as far as I can tell, they, um, they don't get over the experience. They you know, kind of are, end up as book worshippers, you know. They, mm -hmm. you know, but I'm glad to have done it. You know, I mean, I'm really glad because I, I had our, you know, first of all, most of them were 17 or 18 years old when they started. I was 23 when I started, and that's a vast five years. The difference, mm -hmm. between, and I had, you know, I had been through the military. I had already worked out in the marketplace. I'd already had two years of university education before I went there, but I just wanted to read all the books mm -hmm. and I wouldn't have done it on my own. So they had a mm -hmm. whole package and all you had to do is put in your time and take part in the discussions and you got a BA out of it. So how many years did, did you it. do that? Four. 
No, it's a four, four year. Four um, years, yeah. Four year with a BA at the end. And the yeah. BA is high, highly recognized. Um, mm-hmm. uh, you're well educated by the time you came out. So the big thing is that you're actually um, reading the source. You're not reading yes. somebody's textbook about Plato. You're reading Plato, you know. So, you know, so, yeah. But it's good. I mean, for the certain type of student, I think it's a good place. Yeah. If, yeah. But you shouldn't be a book worshiper, and I think uh, it's a bit intimidating. And um, so I I came through it uh, with two really valuable things, and one of them is how do you set up a really great discussion with an ongoing group, which is what Strategic Coach is. And the other thing is that um, um, coming up with new ideas is not a function of thinking about what somebody else has thought. It's developing the ability to think about what you're thinking and then do something with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So those two things. So, so I, I kind of came out on un, uh, uh, what I would say, uh, uncontaminated by the general culture of the place. Uh, who they, they tend not to get over the fact that they, they, they would never be capable of these great thoughts, you know, and the more that they just spend their lives thinking about these great thoughts, um, you know. And yeah, not the, thinking about it as building a platform to to keep yeah. going. Yeah. To push yeah. off of, right. Yeah, I mean, when I look back, you know, Plato and Aristotle couldn't organize a dog fight, you know, mm-hmm. when you realize that with all their thinking, they couldn't organize a dog fight. I mean, if you can't take ideas and turn them into action and results, they're not, to me, they're, they're not. But isn't it, there's something, there's a richness of innovation that's grounded in the depth of understanding of what's come before. Yeah, I, think I, I that's, believe that's true. Yeah. I was, I got, yeah. it was kind of a nice um, a satisfaction to, I thought about you when I heard that, Old Town Road, that the beat that that is based on was a Trent Reznor beat, who Trent Reznor is a musical genius who, you know, um, attributes Bach and these old uh, Mm -hmm. as his inspiration or his, uh, you know, where he's come from. So even it's just, it's just the perfect little, you know, through line that the old town road, this, you know, most current popular song ever has a through line that goes all the way back to, to Bach really. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, um, the Beatles really took a jump when they, um, uh, kind of collaborated with George Martin, you know, that was, mm-hmm. uh, I, I'm trying to think what year, maybe about 64 or 65. Mm-hmm. You could just see a huge jump in the kind of the really uniqueness of what they were doing. And George, uh, George Martin was a classically trained uh, musician, you know, and he had Bach, yes. Bach up to his ears. Well, you know? as, I mean, uh, if funny enough, there was another influence in that that was sort of the same kind of thing in Donovan that. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. I love, I love Donovan. I mean, this yeah. music is just, I, I can spot it right off the bat. We were just watching. Um, I had, I didn't, you never really heard much about Donovan, but I heard an interview with him on Howard Stern and he was described. He's such a student of music, yeah. like a lifelong student. And he had studied every type of music there is. He was telling Howard and really like yeah. um, learned from the, the masters of those things. He yeah. would seek them out all over the world. And then yeah. he was with the Beatles w- in India when they were with the Maharishi. Maharishi. And, and he was teaching John and Paul these chord progressions and things that he had learned from other um from other sources which then really opened up the whole thing that went in their collaboration with uh well uh, with I'll, tell you, I'll tell you another 
another one, another dimension they added right to, uh, uh, right around that time was Phil Spector because yeah. uh, Phil, Phil Spector was an amazing innovator. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, uh, his real breakthrough was the Ronettes. It was Be My mm-hmm. Baby. Yes. Be My Baby is kind of like the crossover. I mean, yeah. I mean I'll mean, i play it. I mean, I wish I could just get rid of the Ronettes and just ah. listen to the listen to the chords. I don't know if you know, is there any service that actually does that? I that wonder if there is. We, we just watched. Uh, I'm, I'm here in Florida. I have... Uh, John Carlton and James Shramko are here oh, at my house. Fantastic. They're at my house this weekend. Give, We're yeah. going. I know. I know. Uh, do I know James. I, I certainly know John. You know? Uh huh. I certainly know John. Yeah. Haven't we seen were, him in a long time. Give him we my were, best. We were watching a documentary last night called 20 Feet from Stardom. And they were talking mm-hmm. about oh. the raw nets. The raw nets were mm-hmm. really featured in there as the uh, as part of it, changing the whole yeah. game. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, it would make sense that you were talking about that last night, and I yes. bring it up today. It is crazy, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But I went in, and there's a whole documentary on Phil Spector and how he put the wall of sound together. And then, oh wow. I I forget who it was. Uh, um, uh, I'll have to go back and read it again. And um, some, you know, really big guy who was big in the, uh, you know, in the '60s. I think it was '60s, '66, '67, uh-huh. probably. And um, he listened for the first time to uh, um, um, Bill Spector, one yeah. of the producers, and it just blows you away. The yeah, the, you know the the sounds that come through, and you can pick it up. And the Beatles got onto it right away. And, yes, and uh, then and, uh, and then the the uh, Beach Boys, the Beach Boys, the Beach Boys, absolutely. Yes. And this guy, a guy said he listened to it, and he was driving along the Pacific Coast Highway, and he said, you know. He said, um, there's a very strong chance right now I'm just going to drive off a cliff because I'll never match that. <laughs> I might as well just keep driving. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah, he said just he said he was just so blown away that he was utterly depressed for five or ten minutes along the Pacific Coast Highway. And he said, yeah. it was lucky I got home because he said, he said, I, I, he said, I just can't believe what this guy has just done. And that, he's listened to, listening to it on a car radio in 1967. You know? Right. And, uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah. But uh, uh, very, very interesting how he, um, you know, none of the, uh, the way he configured the studio, none of the musicians could see each other. And, um, and it didn't. The, if you were in the studio when it was being played, it just sounded like an incredible amount of noise. And all the work was done in the studio is Phil Spector just going in and out with the different mics because every musician was at his own mic. And then he was picking up the background sounds and he had to weave the whole thing together. Uh, it's really a uh, crazy guy. I mean, Phil Spector, you know, I mean, yeah. he's... Uh, He's practicing tunes in his head right now while he's making uh, license plates in the license plates. Prison. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Maybe he's listening to our podcast. So if it is, he might be. Let's, That's let's, right. Let's just do it. Let's just do a shout out to Phil. <laughs> hey, Phil. That's <laughs> funny. There's this will get to him. Yeah. Yeah. Very funny. But, uh, but these influences, you know, and the more you know, uh, without it, um, uh, what I would say, imprisoning you, that's come from the past, but you can just use it as raw material. I think the deeper, um, and I think more resonant if you come up with a new idea, but it, uh, it has, you know, it has sort of acknowledgement to great things that have already been created in the past. I think it, I think it resonates with people, you know. I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah. I think this, um, yeah, I'm very interested in this, this integrator, uh, 
now when I look at it now, it's the simplifier multiplier integrator uh, mm-hmm. as the um, the thing. And I'm realizing now that what I have, it, that it's an interesting combination. Um, to, you know, the, the three together is the thing that makes it, uh, that makes it perfect. The creative and trinity. Yeah. And you've got, <laughs> but you can have, and it's an interesting thing that having multiple integrators is probably a multiplier that. Yeah. Well, you know, it's all uh-huh. chicken and egg stuff. You, because yeah. you, uh, I mean, uh, everything has to be working together, you know. And, yeah. Uh, but uh, I think we've identified three totally different inclinations on the part of people, you know, like, uh-huh. uh, like um, I can see it with Kathy Davis because I've worked with her for almost 15 years. And um, you can just see it's the in between that's really her passion. It's not either. Either of the sides that is her passion. It's, uh-huh. it's the in between. It's the in between, uh-huh. and uh, she wouldn't she wouldn't be happy if she wasn't doing the in, back and forth in between. I, I could really tell she would get bogged down. She would get stressed out if she was doing multiplying or if she was doing simplifying. Uh huh. It, it's inter- and then you've got um, how many how many project managers are you? That's what you, her official title would be, really. Yeah. Would it be? Yeah, that, well, yeah. Her, pro- her project is to, um, first of all, to um, work with the coaches, work with the um, um, program advisors. So, the, you know, the coaches are the front stage person, and then the program advisors are the in-between workshop people, you know, the key mm-hmm. people. Um, focused. And then there's the um, program innovation process, which takes place in my workshop. So she's going uh, going forth between the three, and then there's new workshops, you know, there's new mm-hmm. workshops in the non-DAN. So there's two sectors of the workshops. There's mine, and then there's everything that's not mine. And that's, in terms of actual workshops, it's 90% now. The, um, yeah, um, the the coaches handled ninety percent of the work actual workshop events. So. Yes, and um, so and I I tell her uh, I don't want to know what you're doing, but I want you to, to absolutely know what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's a good. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. And the reason is because I don't want her to have any feeling while she's out there actually creating that other program that I'm looking over her shoulder or she's answerable to me. Right. And because I want it to be an independent capability. I mean, sure, anything happened to me, we have this independent capability that can put together a new workshop. But I you mean, can do everything, would, yeah. Yeah, well, it would change fundamentally if Babs and I weren't here. I mean, um, but... Um, as I told her, what do I care if I'm not here? <laughs> right. Yeah, that's you know, the greatest. I, You're just setting yourself up for disappointment, Dan. I am. I am. <laughs> but not really. <laughs> exactly. It's either, um, you know, it's either a really big party or it's nothing. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, you know, it's like Pascal's wager. Do you know Pascal's wager? French uh, philosopher, mathematician, Blaise uh, Pascal. And I know Pascal's those words, wager. but I'd love to hear Pascal's, the. It's called Pascal's wager. And okay. He said, "Look," he said, "You can believe in God and the afterlife, or you can not believe in God and the afterlife." But he says, "I'll tell you from a wager standpoint, it's better to believe." That there's ah, a God and there's an afterlife. And be wrong. He yeah. says, he says, then um, not to do that because if you don't believe it, then and it turns out there is a God in an afterlife, uh, you're in deep shit. Right, right, right. Oh man! But if you uh, if you believe in the God and afterlife, and there's nothing, well, then there's nothing. Right. 
I had seen something similar to that laid out in a matrix at four quadrants of going through any kind of decision tree like that, like looking, yeah. they were talking about it in the context of global warming, yeah. whether it exists or it doesn't exist. Yeah. And you believe it or you don't believe it or believe it and do something or don't believe it and don't do anything. And that was the yeah. laying those out that the only one with consequences is, is not believing it and not doing anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I just check out the, um, I just keep from year to year. I just check out the prices of uh, coastal real estate. Right, still going up, and and every year it goes up. So yes, um, uh, I don't think they can all be idiots. Yeah, I ask people this with like with with, with sincerity because I don't know the the um thing, but I'm I'm pretty sure that we've had ice ages and no. that it's pretty much warmer than what it was uh in the ice age and yeah. i wondered how where where did all the warming happen before us you know before the uh before the combustion engine yeah i mean it's been happening for 20,000 years i mean most right. of the you know, most of the landmass on the planet was covered 20,000 years ago. Most of the landmass of the Earth was covered with ice. Yeah. You know? And, uh, you know, for example, in Toronto, where Casa Loma is, that was the shoreline of a great glacier lake called Lake Iroquois. Mm. You know? So if you think of the jump, I mean, if you think of the jump up the, you know, it's quite a jump from, um, you know, let's say, Front Street to Casa Loma. I mean, if yes. you think of it, it's probably, it's probably about 75 feet higher. Yeah. Know? So think about that as all being water, you know, and then going east for hundreds and hundreds of miles, you know, so that that gives you an idea. What it, um, that's all the lakes in Ontario, you know, are really glacier, glacier yes. melt lakes. Yeah. Yes. And uh, everything. So it's been melting on a continual basis. Uh, for 20,000 years with some uh, little reverses. There was one for about 300 years from 1400 to seven. I think it was probably 1450 to seven, and the temperatures went down. It was very, very cold, you know, unusually cold for about three centuries, and then it's popped back up. So it was mm. a lot warmer in 1300 than it was in 1700 worldwide. And, uh, and so there's variations. I mean, there's ups and downs and there's El Nino's and there's, you know, solar storms and there's uh, yeah. the, the, the axis of the earth moves. And so we're either further, or further or closer to the sun, depending where we are on the planet. So, um, and then there's clouds and nobody knows really what clouds do to any of this. The complexity of clouds is, Still right. beyond ca calculation and comprehension, but the the thing is um, that we know that fossil burning fuels has done immensely more good than it is causing trouble. Right. Uh, unless it's your ideology that um, it's the single factor that's making a difference, and there's um, there's really no proof. We know it's a heat storing gas, but we don't know if it's big enough or, you know, and actually, I, I, have you been following at all this 16-year-old uh, Swedish girl, this uh, Greta Thunberg? Yeah, mm -hmm. I know I've been watching just as it's unfolding. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's really interesting. It gets more um, weird as you go deeper into who she is one is she comes from very uh wealthy circumstances she lives mm -hmm. you know she lives in you know very very affluent neighborhood her parents are very famous and then going back three or four generations a lot of fame and money in the family including a scientist in the 1890s who won the nobel prize for determining that co2 was a gas stirring it was a 
for a heat storing gas that okay. had not been mm-hmm. identified previous. Uh, so here we have this 16 year old who's a more or less direct descendant of the person who won the Nobel Prize. But uh, Michael Crichton of Jurassic Park fame said that, yes, it's true, it, he, it heats, you know, it takes on greater and greater heat, but not indefinitely. There reaches a point where you've reached the saturation point of the gas, and then it doesn't, um, it actually doesn't take on um, any more warmth. It just reaches a certain point where it's maximized how much warmth it can actually take on. And then you have to look to other factors of why things are getting warmer because you've reached the saturation point for this one particular factor. The way the global warming alarmists say, well, this goes on forever, you know, this goes on forever. But uh, he says probably we're in the neighborhood right now where we've probably reached the saturation point. So I don't know. Uh, I do know that in spite of all the news media being on to this and the academic community and the international bureaucracies and everything else, it ranks about number 25 of the things that people worry about day to day. Right. They just can't get people really excited about this. Right. Yeah. And they show the, you get children excited about this because their parents don't believe in it. And therefore it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a good way to irritate your parents, but uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> not the, like yeah, Alice the, Cooper. I mean, I talked to Alice Cooper. You know, Joe introduced us to Alice Cooper, and uh, yes. I said, "So, so why the particular approach, the theatrical approach that you take?" And he said, "Yeah, he says good question." He says, "You know, I came along late. He's sixties and early seventies, and he said there." Uh, we were trying to figure out how do you differentiate yourself because there were so many rock rock stars out there. And he said, uh, so Shep Gordon, it was actually Shep mm-hmm. Gordon. And Shep said, you know, let's position you as a villain. He said, there's no villains in rock and roll. And uh, so he said, we did. And he said, it worked like a charm. And I said, well, who were you a villain to? And he said, parents and teachers. He said, mm-hmm. you're, you're a villain. Dylan to the parents and teachers, he got the kids for life. And he mm-hmm. said it, wor- it worked in the early 70s. And he said, I have to tell you, in 2019, that's working like a charm. Yes. That's true. Yeah, that's, uh, I love good stories like that. Like, you know, understanding, like, the, there's a um, system behind something, you know. Oh, yeah. thought process behind well the it. other the other thing is that all failure and all success is local say more about that well what i mean is there are no absolute dangers or oh, right you know absolute opportunities there's just local dangers and local opportunities you don't have to yeah. outrun the bear right <laughs> yes that's true you just make sure you always have someone between you and the bear. That's the only. Yes. Thing. That's the only real strategic uh, skill required for, you know, ongoing success. Just so whatever the danger is, make sure there's someone between you and that danger who takes the full brunt of it. So yeah. yeah. I, mean. I was. I, it's funny the discussions that we've been having with uh, uh, John Carlton got here um, a couple of days ago, so we've been having some great conversations about us introducing him to the thought of Cloudlandia and the mainland. And yeah, we were a lot of people talked about, I have to tell you, a lot of people talked about that in the free zone frontier the other day after I Mm -hmm. brought it up and they said, boy, that's a really interesting. And I said, yeah, uh, I said, it's, uh, it's uh, the more you think about it, you, you look at all the troubles in the world and it's, a misunderstanding of people where what are they in one are they in the other are they not giving the right proportion of one to the other or they're not getting them to uh you know integrate with each other i said it's all you know we're it's uh your ability that's yes. why i said you know that coaching between exponential technology and exponential teamwork is yes. the fundamental capability of the 21st century Agreed. Yeah, we were driving yeah. through. Uh, there's a old area, 
very close to my house here called Mountain Lake Estates. And it was... This is in Orlando, near yeah, Orlando. Right? Yes, this is... Orlando. In, so, so old would be in Orlando. That would be pre-1960, right? <laughs> this goes way back. This right. goes, uh, you know, we're, in the we're 30s, not talking about kind that. of. We're not talking about Massachusetts here. <laughs> no, no, we're talking about in the in the twenties oh, and thirties. Right, yeah. yeah, yeah. That back there's an area where the DuPonts and the Rockefellers and the old uh money when they were Pl- coming south on the Plague railroad. Plague, 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 yes. Plague were built the railroad. Plague yes, was exactly. Yeah. So before yeah. they got it all the way down to, to Palm Beach or whatever, here in central yeah. Florida, Lake Wales. The Keys, was, it actually went to Key West. You know, wow. The big thing of putting, they didn't, they had a railroad to Key West before they had roads. Oh, wow. Yeah. Very interesting. But there's these yeah. old, you know, huge Florida mansions that are, you know, you could see this was the place you know back in oh, the yeah. day and even yeah. now mountain lake estates there's all these you know old homes that their descendants and stuff still um still have it's a very exclusive i mean it's kept up in there is it kept oh yeah up yeah no oh it's it's yeah. very very low-key very exclusive um you very know no, yes but no um in an old school way very understated. proper yes understated. Understated. understated exactly yeah and some yeah. of these if you have old to, if uh, you have to ask how much it costs uh you clearly do not deserve to that's exactly people. right yes and you have to be invited by the committee and all that stuff to uh am, to am. be approved but people are are you know restoring these you know i'm saying like you know 12, 15,000 square foot mansion style yeah. homes, you know, that are um, just beautiful. Yeah. No internet back then. So you were talking, you were talking, say, because you were talking to John Carlton about. Yeah, that. we were saying about this, this exploring, like back in the day, um, one of the great marketers, Albert Lasker, talked about. Sure. I remember reading with delight him talking about this uh this cabinet on his wall where he subscribed to every newspaper in the country and had them mm. delivered to him where he had access to all of the nation's information news. and advertising and news exactly yeah and i thought how you know, going to those great lengths back then, what they had to do compared to what we have now, you know, the, you had to yeah, seek but that out was more. terrific. Yeah. Yeah. But that was terrific. You know, I mean, I mean, uh, not, you only have to be ahead of the guy between you and the bear. <laughs> That's exactly right. And that was the, you know, advantage. I, know. I mean, yeah. Yeah. That, that was, was the, enough. Do you know the uh, Rothschild family? The, you know the very, very wealthy European yes. family, Rothschild, and you know the they have financial, they have banks and financials, you know, and and everything like that. But they made their great fortune on one day, and it was the day that um, Wellington beat Napoleon. Yes, or, uh, at um, Waterloo, and they had. Um, they had messengers, the Rothschild messengers had a better system of getting news back to London than the government did. Yes. So about two hours before the news came in for the government, the Rothschilds already had it. And the main Rothschild in London went down to the stock exchange and he started saying, sell, 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 sell. Uh-huh. And the message that the government, uh, the government uh, messengers were coming back from uh, coming back from uh, Waterloo, and immediately he said, "Bye, bye." Yes, bye. and more fortunes were lost, and a, gr- a massive one was created on that w- one day in about uh, in a 
you know, in, in the space of one trading day, yes. uh, mass uh, whole fortunes were wiped out, and yes. his was created and established. And, uh, yes, yes, but you can develop enemies that way. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, legacies. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that thing about in- information, you know, is really. I just read uh, fascinating history of the beginning of the. Pacific War and the Second World War, and that the uh, Americans, after Pearl Harbor, had cracked the Japanese uh, naval codes, and um, they were coming for a knockout blow at the Battle of Midway, and uh, they knew everything about the Japanese fleet, where they were, and everything, and they set them into a trap, and the entire Japanese Navy had... um, six aircraft carriers and aircraft carriers were clearly the naval war of the future and uh because pearl harbor had been um devastating because the japanese for the first time fully used aircraft carriers and um but uh, in a space of about uh 13 minutes, they lost three of their carriers. So three of their carriers were just devastated. So that's half their Navy. And then the fourth one uh, limped away, but then it sank. It was scuttled and sank. So two-thirds of their offensive Navy was destroyed in less than 24 hours. And uh, they were on the defense for the rest of the... They were on playing defense for the rest of the war. And the Americans during that time, I think... Um, they had four carriers. The Japanese had six. The Japanese lost four. The Americans lost one at the battle, so they had three. And then they added 38 more during the, the war. So at the end of the war, they had 41 aircraft carriers. Wow. And and, um, and um, even today, one of the big carriers, you know, they have 11 of these what are called strike carriers. Mm-hmm. They have about 85. They have about 85 jets on them all and they have massive massive armament including they probably have two or three nuclear subs that go along with them and they have nukes on the aircraft carriers with cruise missiles and everything like that one of those carriers uh, carrier groups is equal to all the other carrier carriers in the world and the u.s has 11 of them 11 wow of them. wow yeah now, as a matter of fact, the Navy in the world, the U.S. with an asterisk, uh, is the number one Navy. Then you have the Brits, then I think the French, the Japanese, and I, I don't know who number five is. But six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, and sixteen are each um, one of the U.S. strike carrier groups. They oh, rank my. it from no- from number six to number sixteen as great navies of the world. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, <laughs> and that, that's that that switch in paradigm happened between Pearl Harbor and this Battle of Midway. It was six months almost to the day, and the U.S. thought the war was going to be about battleships. And within six months, they just switched, and um, you know the enormous industrial power that they had. Uh, that was unlimited. also that's I mean, similar to the greatest one of the greatest political debate moments I've ever witnessed is uh, is. Obama and Mitt Romney and Mitt Romney pointing out as a uh, indication of the, you know, Obama's not non-military focus. He was pointing out that there are less ships in the military or in the Navy today than there were in world war one. And Obama said to him without skipping a beat, well, that's true, but there's also less horses and bayonets. <laughs> and he explained to Mitt that there are these things called aircraft carriers, and we yeah, build yeah. these big boats and launch planes off of them. Like it was just yeah. so funny the the progress. Yes, there's less horses and bayonets. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> things advance, Mitt. You know. And pretty yeah, soon yeah. it'll all be drones, you know. Yeah. Poor Mitt. Mitt. Mitt's like a punching bag. I'll tell you. I mean, uh, it, it, did you see this last week? He's got a secret uh, 
social media, but uh, Twitter is, uh, uh, and he's called, uh, um, he's got a French name, Pierre something. Oh and no. He, and he comes across as this very petty, mean spirited guy. Who's oh boy. Nipping at, at Trump's heels and everything like that. And oh, this is a great, great example of, of envy and resentment. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, he's just, uh, yeah, he has. You had your chance. I mean, you only get one yeah, chance. At that, that's it. Uh, you know, at, at that price, you only get one chance. And the, that's right. I was noticing Bill Bill Maher, you know, who's very definitely left. But he, I saw him last night or the night before. He said, "It's time for the Clintons just to go away." He said, "They mm. should just go away." <laughs> go away. <laughs> just go away. You know. Yes. <laughs> he says right now uh, she is Trump's biggest asset. I mean, the more she talks, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, and I, it's very, very important uh, how one conduct oneself when you lose. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think char character is more determined um, by experiences of losing and failing than it is by winning and succeeding. You know. Uh, but, uh, do you think she's going to come back, or is it going to be Uncle Bernie? Well, it's uh, you know, I, I think she's a bit like uh, you know, Terminator One, you know, until the red light goes out. Right. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Remember the last scene where the, I do the Terminator gets crushed by an industrial press. You know, that's it. And it's still, it's still trying to get a hold of a uh, thing and then the red light in their eyes goes out. I think, mm -hmm. I think uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, and uh, anyway, but it's fascinating. Boy, we've really covered uh, the landscape today. <laughs> That's always fun. I love it. Okay. Well, well, I'll see you in, I'll see you in Scottsdale. Yes, sir. I'll see you this week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.